Could you look at Acts chapter 3, verse 24? Acts 3, verse 24. It's a funny place to start lectures on prophecy in 1 and 2 Kings, but uh, you'll see the purpose of it in a minute. Acts 3, verse 24. There we read, Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Now, God's servant there, of course, is Jesus. Uh, he sent his servant Jesus to, first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The, uh, there's one or two things I want to take out of this, these verses before we go into 1 Kings. First of all, notice that it's all the prophets from Samuel on. There were prophets before the time of Samuel, uh, odd ones, not many. Moses is called a prophet. Uh, there was Deborah the prophetess in the book of Judges and uh, uh, one or two others. Uh, but the, uh, there's a movement of prophecy starts with Samuel. It's as if Samuel started something going that ran on down through the centuries in Israel. And in fact, it's ran on right down till about 400 B.C., uh, now, Samuel is dated uh, round about, uh, give or take, we, we don't really know the date, give or take 50, 60, maybe even 100 years, about 1100 BC. Uh, but to go back to about 1100 BC and then down to 400 BC. In that 700 year period, there was a movement of prophets, uh, a con successive waves of prophets, uh, men of God who stood up and spoke the word of God, and it all started in Samuel's time. Uh, indeed, that's uh, part of the reason why the, the Jews include uh, the books of Samuel and Kings under the heading prophets rather than, as we would put them, under the heading history because the, to them, the stories in Samuel and Kings are really stories about prophets, about God's movement through the prophets. And as you know from your, uh, your Way of the Spirit study last, uh, last week, uh, Samuel, uh, God raised him up as a prophet and as a prophet, he called the people back to God. Hmm? And around him he gathered other prophets. I'll come back to Samuel in a minute. <coughs> and they have spoken and have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets. Now you know what an heir is. Uh, some of you are heirs uh, to an inheritance that's perhaps your parents or your aunts or something. You, but it's the person who leaves a will. And in the will, you're the heir. Or if they've got no will, then you inherit what your mom and dad has. Hmm? Well, you are the heirs of the prophets. That means that what the prophets had is your inheritance. What did the prophets have? The prophets had the word of God and the anointing of the Spirit of God. That's basically it. And so what they had, you have. Uh, that means that when we come to read the stories of the prophets in the Old Testament, we're reading about people who understood the same things as you understand and you today understand the same things as they understood because you, I presume all of you, know what the Word of God is and you also know what the Holy Spirit is because you're baptized in the Spirit, I hope. <laughs> is that right? Um, well, the prophet was the one upon whom the Spirit came as the Spirit has come upon you and the one who could hear the Word of God, take it to his heart and speak it. Well, that's, uh, that's it. You are the heirs of the prophets. So when we go back to read these stories of Old Testament prophets, we're not reading about strange, shaggy men who appeared on a mountainside and cried out and pulled thunderbolts out of heaven and did funny things like you see on some films. You know, you see a film of a prophet and he stands there with the wind howling around his ears and a staff in his hand and lightning flashing out of the sky and he's calling forth thunder on the earth. No, 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 no. Prophets were just like you. We're talking about kindred spirits or, or people just like you, not much different. When you read about Elijah, potentially any of you people here are Elijahs. Uh, when you read about Samuel, you're potentially Samuels. Uh, there's, there, there are men like you who heard the word of God and know the power of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> so we're not going to read about strangers. We're going to read about people that are, are just like us. And you're heirs of the covenant God made with your fathers particularly what he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Uh, I spoke to you about this last week. God's desire is to bless. 
When God created man on the earth, the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, it says God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and uh, increase and subdue it. God's desire is to bless you that you may multiply. When he came to Abraham, his promise to Abraham was, I'm going to bless you and bless your family and bless your descendants and through them I'm going to bless all, fa- all peoples on earth. The, the will and the desire and the purpose of God for every man is to bless. The thing that hinders the blessing of God is our sin. Sin, as it were, puts a blanket over our heads and we cannot receive the blessing of God. And that's why the call of the prophet is always to repentance, to break free from the sin and to come under the blessing of God because God's desire is to bless. That's always what God wants. Jesus We're told, when God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you. When Jesus preached his first recorded sermon on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, how did he start it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, 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 blessed. He sent him to you first of all to bless you. But by turning you, each of you, from your wicked ways, the prophet turns you from your wicked ways so that God can bless you. And there's no magic or mystique about prophets beyond that. It's a word, the word prophet uh, to a lot of people conjures up the picture of uh, somebody with a crystal ball gazing into it and seeing mists rising and through the mists seeing funny things happening in the future. And that's rubbish. Prophecy has nothing whatsoever to do with that. That's spiritism, mediumism, wizardry. It has nothing to do with prophecy. These things are condemned in the Bible. Prophecy is not crystal ball gazing. Prophecy is not gazing into the future in a kind of dreamy haze and wondering what's going to happen. Prophecy is quite simply hearing the word of God, receiving the power of the Spirit of God so that you can pass the word on to other people, to call them to repentance back to God so that God can bless them. Okay. (coughs) Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And the beauty of it is these days, what they had then is for all of us, because all of us today are heirs of the prophets. That was what they had, it's our inheritance. And we're also heirs of the covenant God made with our fathers. Praise God, the the promise of blessing is for us. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And when God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from his wicked ways. I don't know a better definition of prophecy than that in the Bible. There are plenty of other definitions, but that really is a good one, because it uh, involves you as well. (coughs) You know, there are two kinds of knowledge. There's information knowledge that you take into your head, and once you've got it, you you have an understanding, and on the basis of that understanding, you can do things. Uh, Like, um, for example, a, a motor car. I can take informa- have information knowledge about a motor car. I can buy a manual that explains to me all about how it works, uh, how the pistons work and how the fuel comes in and the ignition system and how the brakes and everything work. I've got that information knowledge uh, and I understand motor cars. And I can go to a motor car, I can lift the bonnet and say, that's wrong, that needs replacing, do this, this does this, this does that. Hmm? Information knowledge. There's another kind of knowledge. And the other kind of knowledge is the man who knows nothing about that but can sit in the car, turn the switch and press the, press the button and drive down the road in it. <laughs> and he knows his car. He knows that the steering's a bit slack so that he needs to turn it a bit more at the corner and he, need, and he knows that the brakes are a bit dicey and so he knows how to u- use them. That kind of knowledge is different from the other kind of knowledge. That's knowing so that you can, you can have a, a kind of relationship. It's relationship knowledge. Now, <coughs> uh, Information knowledge will enable you to make assessments and judgments. Relationship knowledge will enable you to live. With the knowledge out of the textbook, I cannot live in the car. I'd probably sit behind the wheel, drive down the road and and run into a wall. (laughs) Uh, But the other kind of knowledge, the intimate personal relationship knowledge, with that I I can live, I can enjoy it. I can take the car out in the motorway and go somewhere, even though I don't understand all the workings under the bonnet. The, um, the knowledge of God is of that second kind. The prophets were not men who were theologians, 
who understood theology and passed on information about God. They were men who knew God and knew the life of God and said to Israel, look, if you want to live, this is how to do it. Follow that. Right, let's, uh, let's go back to the Old Testament then. God sent his son Jesus to bless you, not by giving you lots of information, but uh, by teaching you what the life of God is. John, at the end of his gospel, puts it this way, these things were written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. Not that by believing you may have knowledge, but that you may have life in his name. So when the prophets say to the people, know the Lord, you need to know the Lord. Or Hosea saying, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He doesn't mean you're destroyed for lack of information. When they say know the Lord, it doesn't mean sit down with a textbook and learn all the theology and the information. He means get to know God so that you can live. <coughs> 1 Samuel, uh, you've already studied this in your uh, first uh, week study of the Way of the Spirits in your yellow book, Heirs of the Prophets. Uh, there you see a man, or a young lad, Samuel, who knew very little. Samuel grew up at the temple at Shiloh, and that wasn't a mess. The people there were destroyed indeed for lack of knowledge. Uh, the priest had two sons that were utterly wayward. They, uh, they, they didn't know how to behave themselves. They, indeed, they knew how to behave themselves too much in the wrong kind of way. And old Eli, who was half blind, was, uh, had lost control of them. He, I suppose he knew God, uh, but uh, it was like a forgotten knowledge in some ways. And the boy Samuel grew up in this uh, strange place uh, with these strange people. Uh, it's amazing that the Lord could preserve him, but God's hand was on the boy. Now what God did was God came to him one night personally and gave him personal revelation knowledge. <coughs> He spoke to him. He said, Samuel, used his name, Samuel. And Samuel said, here am I. Samuel spoke with God. And at the end of the time, God said certain things to Samuel. But at the end of the time, the thing that must have lasted more with Samuel than anything else was the memory of the encounter. The words were important. Of course, the message was important. And Samuel had to go and preach the message. For the rest of his life, he had to preach the message. But what was at the heart of the message was that personal encounter with God. You see, God could easily have arranged that somebody deliver a letter to Samuel. <laughs> and in the letter, the message would have been written. Well, Samuel could have read the message. Or maybe somebody could have come along with a Bible and said to Samuel, look, see what's written in the Bible. It's totally, totally different when you've actually met the Lord and he has spoken to you. Transforms everything. And the prophet is the man who stands in the presence of God, has met God and has that kind of knowledge. Not just knowledge of the message, but knowledge of the one who gives the message. <coughs> Chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. There, was, there weren't many people around who understood what was happen happening with Samuel. There wasn't anybody to teach him. There was nobody who could say to Samuel, come on, I'll teach you how to be a prophet. Because the word of the Lord was rare at that time. <coughs> Verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. Not the message of the Lord, but the Lord himself was with Samuel as he grew up. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. And there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. You see, at the heart of the prophet is not just a message. I know I've spoken to you about the word of God coming to you. And it's the word that you receive and the word you pass on. But there is also the spirit of God. When God moves, he moves by his word and his spirit in harmony. And the spirit is something more personal in a way. 
It's the experiential side, if you like. I know the Spirit means power, but the Spirit means the personal presence of God. You know that God's there, not just because of the words he says, but because of the fact of his presence. Uh, the, uh, and the Lord continued to appear to him, and Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. When Jesus uh, came along more than a thousand years later, everybody knew he was a prophet. Jesus said to the disciples one day, who do men say that I am? And the first thing they said, they say you're a prophet. In fact, some of them say you're Elijah or Jeremiah, or one of the old prophets, but they say you're a prophet. Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee, even when he was arrested and the soldiers beat him up, they blindfolded him and they mocked him for being a prophet. They said to, the, said to him, prophesy to us. They knew he was a prophet. How did they know he was a prophet? Because God was with him. The mark of the prophet is not just that he speaks words, but that God is with him. And you can see it. You can sense it. You know that when you've been visited by the man, he's not just spoken a message to you, but God himself has walked into your presence with that man. Hmm? It's, uh, th this is where the Spirit comes in. You see, the prophet is not just the man who gives the word of God. He's the man who knows God, has a personal relationship with God. And there's no other way to have a personal relation with God except by the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel. And wherever Samuel went, men knew that God went with him. That's what makes the prophet a peculiar person. Uh, there are plenty of folk who are preachers. And a preacher is a man who can handle the Word of God. I, you pray that he does so with the anointing of the Spirit. But you can get people preaching without the anointing of the Spirit. Usually it's pretty dry and pretty boring. Uh, but they can st you can still preach without the anointing of the Spirit. But you cannot prophesy, or not in true prophecy anyway, without the anointing of the Spirit. Hmm? <coughs> you can hear somebody else preaching, and you can say, Oh, that's interesting. And then you can go and preach the same thing. You can't prophesy that way. You can hear somebody else prophesy, and you can say that's interesting, but what you pass on is not prophecy. It's somebody else's prophecy. You're not prophesying. Because you can only prophesy in this, out of this personal relationship. There's a, a lovely story in, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. I'll get around to 1 Kings in a minute. <laughs> uh, in Acts... Chapter um, 18. <coughs> At the end of chapter 18, there's a story about a man called Apollos. You've heard of Apollos, haven't you? He, was, uh, he went to Corinth, and uh, Paul writes about him in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because there were people in Corinth who were saying, I'm for Paul, and I'm for Apollos, and I'm for neither of them, I'm for Christ. And Paul was bothered about the body of Christ being divided. Well, the body of Christ is usually divided around people, uh, the charismatic gurus, the, the strong personalities. Uh, well, there were two strong personalities at Corinth. Paul and Apollos had both been there, uh, and they were both good preachers. Uh, but Christ was also there, and there were those who didn't want to either of them. Well, anyway, let's look at Apollos for a minute. Verse 24 Meanwhile, Acts 18 24, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos. A native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was a learned man. Now notice he's a Jew. Uh, that means he's grown up with the, with the Bible, the Old Testament tradition. He's a native of Alexandria. Now Alexandria was a university town. It was a cultured place. And, and this man was a graduate of Alexandria University. He was a learned man. He came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, a good education and a good knowledge of the Bible. That's off to a good start. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He had been taught all about Jesus. And he spoke with great fervor. He was a good, fiery preacher. And he taught about Jesus accurately. He didn't preach heresy. He was preaching truth, accurate truth. He'd got his facts right. So he knew only the baptism of John. Now remember, John said, I baptize with water for repentance, but there's one that cometh after me. 
he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So this man knew the baptism of John, the baptism of water for repentance, but obviously he didn't know the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You could say he was a good evangelical, but he wasn't yet a charismatic. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. It must have been quite a, a, quite a strong personality, this. A man who really knew his Bible, a fiery preacher, and he comes in and he starts to proclaim Jesus to the Jews there. When Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila are a delightful couple. They are a very homely couple. They were very good at hospitality. They put Paul up more than, on more than one occasion. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, there's an awful lot behind that little statement. I can see Priscilla and Aquila listening to this, uh, this amazing preacher that's arrived in Ephesus uh, with his strong sermons and the truth about Jesus spilling out from his lips. He knows his Bible so well. And here's this homely little couple, and they look at each other halfway through the sermon and say, we need to get this man sorted out. Let's invite him home after the service. So after the service, they come up to him and say, good sermon, Apollos. I uh, really enjoyed that. Would you like to come around for a cup of tea? <laughs> or maybe more than that, a meal, a bed for the night. And I can imagine Apollos going around there, and within half an hour, him lying under the table, praying in tongues. <laughs> uh, you know, there was something lacking. The man had the facts, the information, he had, he had the commitment to heart, it was all there. But the one thing he lacked, what, what makes a man the difference between a preacher and a prophet, he lacked that personal anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see? And uh, you, the, there's a, the story goes on, it's an interesting little story. Chapter 19. <coughs> well, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, and he found a group of Apollos' converts. There he found some disciples. Now, disciple is only used of disciples of Jesus. These were disciples of Jesus, converts of Apollos, and asked them. He took one look at them, and he could see the same as Apollos, as Aquila and Priscilla had seen in Apollos. He took one look at them. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, uh, no. We've not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. Well, that's a bit strange. I, I, th there's a bit of translation problem here, but I won't comment on it. They, they, weren't, they weren't personally aware about the Spirit. Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. See, that was the only baptism that Apollos had known at that time. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that's in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. When the Spirit came, it turned them into prophets. You understand this now? <clears throat> the prophet is not just the man who speaks the word of God but as the man who speaks the word of God out of a personal knowledge of the Lord, which he has received through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why when you come to that uh, chapter that you were looking at the other day in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 10, where Saul is about to become king of Israel and Samuel anoints him to become king of Israel, <coughs> Samuel is to give Saul... Uh, a, a copy of the law, the book of the covenants, the, the book that was written at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, 1 Samuel 10 verse 25. Uh, Samuel explained to the people the regulations of kingship and he wrote them down in a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. But it wasn't going to be enough just to give a book of instructions. Saul also, if he was going to lead God's people, and God's people were a people that were already moving in revival. They were a people who had been coming back to God in repentance Samuel's prophesying to them had called them back to God and they were, th this was a nation returning to the Lord, a nation in revival. And if anybody's going to be king over a nation like that, then he must himself not just have an instruction manual, not just the word, but he must himself know the heart of revival. And so the first thing that Samuel does is sends him down the road to meet his group of prophets so that he can receive the Spirit himself. And you know how the story goes in 1 Samuel chapter 10 about how they went down the road and they found this little charismatic group playing their guitars and their tambourines doing a dance out in the street uh, prophesying. And when Saul met up with him, the Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. Hmm? He had his personal encounter with the Lord 
And out of that personal encounter with the Lord, he began to speak the word of God. Whatever it all means, uh, it's difficult to imagine yourself there in some ways, especially with the NIV translation when you see a procession of prophets. A uh, procession is very churchy. I don't think there's a procession at all. I think it was just a group of them enjoying themselves. In fact, the Hebrew word doesn't use the word procession at all. It's just a band of prophets, a group of prophets. And I can see them having a great time in the Lord, praising the Lord. And along comes this guy, Saul, and he meets them there, and they're all filled with the Spirit, thoroughly enjoying themselves. And whoops, here goes. (laughs) The Spirit comes upon Saul. uh, uh, But already, you see, God had changed his heart as he was going along, and he was open to the Spirit this time. Now, the fact that that group of prophets is there shows that Samuel's anointing, the Lord himself had appeared to Samuel, and he was anointed as a prophet, but his anointing was spilling over to other people, and around him were a a group of prophets. There wasn't, Samuel didn't just walk alone through history. He's often presented as a a lone, lonely figure, but he wasn't. He had a sympathetic group around him. When things got tough, Samuel could go back to his group and say, pray for me. (laughs) Let's praise the Lord together. I don't know what he did, uh, but you get the example in 1 Samuel 19 of Samuel standing at the head of the group of the prophets. Remember when Saul sent his men to arrest, uh, arrest David, and David had joined the group of the prophets at the end of 1 Samuel 19. And there's the group of the prophets together at worship, and Samuel standing at the head of them. It's like a kind of charismatic community. But the purpose of this was revival. Samuel was prophesying, giving the word of God to call the nation back to repentance so that God could bless them. Acts chapter 3, you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with Abraham to bless you. God wanted this nation blessed, not cursed. So he raised up a man upon whom he put his spirit and to whom he gave his word to call the people back in repentance to bless them. But there were those who had caught the vision. They'd caught the fire of it. And with that vision and with that fire on themselves, they too were standing up with Samuel to support him in his preaching and no doubt doing a bit themselves into the bargain. Uh, They were like uh, a little army, a little group of soldiers for God, equipped for the battle. You could almost say they were (laughs) proto-Christians. Uh, they, were, they were already heirs of the prophets. Well, they were the prophets. Uh, and God had put his spirit upon them. And in the anointing of the spirit with the word of God, they were heading up the revival in their day. It's God's pattern right down through history, always, that God will choose a man, put his spirit upon that man, and that's, uh, that others will gather around the man and, and the, the group will, will work for revival. It usually means that the, the creation of a church or the creation of a revival center or something like that. I mean, scattered through this country here, there are, there are hundreds of them, but in each locality, there's a man who can stand up and say, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And others recognize that they gather around him and they receive the anointing that he has in the spirit and together they work for the revival of the region. Uh, Well, it's an old, old pattern. It goes way back to early Old Testament times. From Samuel on. From Samuel on. Samuel's the first instance of it, but from his day on, this is how God's done it. Uh, The expression that I like to use is that uh, these are God's shock troops for revival. But they're like that. They're like the the cutting edge, the, the, the thrust for revival that pushes into the, in, into the, the heart of the, of the land that's turned its back on God to bring the message of God with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's really one and two kings I want to concentrate on, but I've gone all through that in, as background because uh, the, um, uh, you'll only understand the same thing happening in, the new t- in, in one and two kings if you understand this, what's behind it. But before, uh, another bit, before we turn to two kings, or to one kings, I should say, Uh, We need to look also at 2 Samuel chapter 7. (coughs) 2 Samuel 7. Now this is a slightly different setting. Uh, Samuel is now dead, and uh, no doubt most of the prophets who who were around him are gone by this time. Uh, David is on the throne. 
But behind David, there also stands a prophet, or alongside him there stands a prophet. Well, there, were, there was more than one prophet, but this particular one, Nathan, anyway. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Can you imagine the two of them? David's got this palace, and one day he's out walking in the palace garden with Nathan, maybe after the evening meal. Uh, I'm using just a bit of imagination here, but it helps a bit. Uh, just imagine the two of them out for a walk in the cool of the evening. And uh, David is bothered. Uh, life's got good for him. The kingdom is established. He's now got his capital city, Jerusalem. He's got a palace there, and it's nice to go out and walk in the garden. But he's bothered about something. And he turns to Nathan, who's almost like his religious advisor, his Archbishop of Canterbury almost, uh, and he says to him, uh, well, no, he had a high priest as well. He says to him, Nathan, there's something bothering me. You know, it's great. God's blessed me, and it's really been good. And I've got, look at this lovely house I've got, and the beautiful gardens, and, and the kingdom established, and so on. But I'm bothered. Here's me living in this nice house, and the ark of God's still just in a tent. And Nathan says, yes, I know what's bothering you. He says, well, but you're, you know the Lord. He says, you do whatever in your heart is right and get on with it. Hmm? The word of the Lord through the, through the prophet. Well, it wasn't the word of the Lord. Verse 3, Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for, God, for the Lord's with you. Well, that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying to Nathan, no, Nathan, that wasn't right. <laughs> that came out of your own mind, didn't it? Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built a house of cedar for me? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Well, the first thing God has said to him, listen, I've been in a tent long enough and I've been quite happy. Don't you bother about that. Let's get that out of the way to begin with. Now then, tell my servant David, this is the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. This is your word, David. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock, not to be a temple builder, but to be a ruler over my people Israel. When did the word of the Lord to you, David, ever, when was it ever, go and build a temple for me? Your call was to be a ruler. Now, it's important this. Important for you as well. If God has said something to you, there can be lots of other things that are good to do, and indeed things that are the will of God should be done. It was God's will that a temple should be built. But it wasn't God's will for David for him to do it. If David had got into the business of temple building, it would have been a total distraction off the job that he had to do. And the job that he had to do was to establish a strong kingdom. Now, David had taken the, the nation out of Philistine oppression and out of, uh, out of terrible conditions. And he was, he, he, there was enough on his hands without him getting involved in temple building. It doesn't mean to say that temple building was wrong or was bad. It, indeed, God eventually had it done through Solomon. But it wasn't what he wanted David to do. And the message to, through Nathan was, look, David, what did God say to you? Did God ever say to you to build temples? No, what God said to you was to be the ruler of my people. <clears throat> you can apply this back to your, uh, to your own ministries or whatever. Uh, a church sits down in committee one day and says, well, all the other churches around here are doing evangelism. Well, that'll be the day. Uh, but uh, a lot of the other churches around here are doing evangelism. We ought to do it as well. So how will we go about it? Well, St. Saviour's down the road, they're going round and, uh, and knocking at doors. And St. Matthias is uh, doing out in the street. And, and the, 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 the charismatic club around the corner are, uh, are, uh, are having house parties and things. Uh, 
what will we do? Uh, we ought to do something different from all the rest. <laughs> and so they go and plan some kind of scheme of leafleting and all that. And at the end of it, they spend a lot of money and expend a lot of energy. And at the end of it, they might get a quarter of a convert or none at all. God had not spoken to them about that. Now, evangelism is a good thing to do. And in a sense, we're all, we've all got to do it. But what is the word of the Lord to you at this time? You see? <coughs> I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel, and I will also give you rest from all your enemies. You see, that's the blueprint. You make this nation so strong that the borders are secure and the people can be at rest. That's the call, not temple building. And the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom and he is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What a statement. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Just think for a minute. Israel had never had a king. And then Saul came along. Saul was made king. His son didn't become king after him. Uh, there's no pattern before uh, Saul's time of, uh, of any, or before David's time, of any kingship for him to follow. You can't say that, well, I'll be the first king in a dynasty because we've had dynasties before. There, hadn't been, there was no principle of dynastic succession established in Israel at this time. And God comes to David and says to David, I'll make your kingship so strong. You do what you're told. You be ruler. Establish the kingdom. And I'll bless you with a son after you. He'll build the temple. But I'll bless you with a kingdom that will last forever. Now, on the death of Solomon, the kingdom split in two. Uh, the northern tribes were lost to the house of David, but there still was a son of David on the throne in Jerusalem. And there continued to be a son of David on the throne in Jerusalem for many years after. I'll come back to this in a minute. But the promises of an eternal dynasty, I will be his father and he shall be my son. That's the kind of relationship I will have with, your son, with, your, with this dynasty. The kings that rule will be like son to me. Hmm? That means, of course, that when he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with the floggings inflicted by men. But when he does wrong, I'll not take away this promise. My love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. If the kings misbehave, They'll suffer for it, but my promise is that to eternity there will be a son of David ruling over my kingdom. Hmm? Now, there was a crisis of faith at the time of the exile when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem because then the king was removed into exile. And the question was, what's happened to the promise to David? This was the prophetic word of God. The word of the Lord came to Nathan and Nathan passed it on. This was the promise of God. What's happened to the king? Well, the uh, history interpreted that in, terms of, uh, in these terms. We did wrong. We sinned against God. And God promised that if we sinned, he would punish. This is punishment, but God's promise still stands. God has not withdrawn his promise. And the promise is forever. So in the forever there is going to be a king ruling over God's people who will be a son of David. Well, we're now in the forever because Jesus came as the son of David and he now rules forever over God's people. So the promise has never been lost. Uh, but the Jews looked forward to the return of Messiah. In God's time, he would take up the promise and restore it. Uh, and what's happening, the interruption in the succession is simply punishment for sin. 
<coughs> now, this is uh, the, 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 the covenants with Abraham, with Moses, and now this is the covenant with David. Now, this covenant has come through a prophet. The word of the Lord came directly uh, to, um, to Abraham. Moses, I mean, Abraham was called a prophet. Moses was called a prophet as well. But the word of the Lord came directly to Moses at Mount Sinai. The word of the Lord doesn't come directly to David. It comes to David through a prophet. We're now in the age of the prophets, you see, from Samuel on. And this covenant is mediated through a prophet. Uh, in later Jewish tradition, you find this in, in the Epistle to the Hebrews. The Epistle to the Hebrews speaks about the law being medi mediated by angels, that Moses went up the mountain and there were angels spoke with him. Uh, but uh, but this, this time, the word comes through a prophet. You see, God is, is mediating his will and his desire through the prophets. Samuel, it's to the nation because there is no king. But now there's a change in the nation. The nation is now, now led by a king. And if the prophet has got to speak to anybody now, it's got to be to the king. Of course the prophet will have to speak to the people, but the prophets also now have to speak to the king because uh, they're the men that need to hear the word and to act on it. Right, at long last, let's get into 1 Kings. Everything went well with the promise to David uh, through David's reign, because when David died, he left behind him a strong kingdom. He left a kingdom that was united. Uh, the, uh, let's have a look at this little map here. There's the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan, and the Dead Sea down the bottom. Uh, Jerusalem, roughly at the level of the top of the Dead Sea. Uh, this, uh, the, the tribes inhabited all the region from, uh, uh, from Galilee down through Transjordan uh, and down south in Judah, down towards the Judean desert at the bottom there. David had extended the rule beyond the tribal territory to encompass Edom, Moab, and Ammon, and right up to Damascus and Syria up there. You've got Damascus up here, and this region is known as Syria, or Aram in Old Testament times. Aram, the Arameans. Today we call it Syria. Across here you've got Ammon, and uh, then down opposite the Dead Sea you've got Moab, and down to the south of the Dead Sea, you've got Edom. And over by the coast here, roughly parallel with the Dead Sea, down the coastal strip, what's today known as the Gaza Strip, you've got the Philistines. Philistia. Now, David incorporated all that into his, well, little empire, really. The, 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 the territory of the tribes was the territory around the, on either side of the Jordan and to the, uh, to the west of the Dead Sea. Uh, the, uh, David uh, conquered the Philistines, the Arameans, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites. And he left to Solomon a little empire, uh, ruled from, from Jerusalem here. And uh, you know that the wealth and everything had flowed into the land and it had become a very uh, strong uh, place, blessed of the Lord. The measure of the blessing is summed up beautifully in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20. In 1 Kings 4, verse 20, we read, The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. Beautiful, isn't it? This is the blessing of the Lord, you see. David, I know David made mistakes. Every man makes mistakes. And David made some pretty big mistakes. But David repented. And David, basically, his heart was after God. And as he walked with God, God blessed him. He walked according to the principles that he was taught by the law and the prophets. And God blessed him. And God granted him increase. And he left all this to his son Solomon. And all went well with Solomon to begin with. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Uh, and the people of Israel and Judah were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. I mean, that's what God promised to Abraham they would be. Remember? The covenant with Abraham and your heirs of that covenant. Well, already the covenant promise was coming to fulfillment. Already the people were being blessed with increase. And also, they ate, they drank, and they were happy. What more could they want? <laughs> this was God fulfilling his promise to bless because the people were walking with God. But Solomon began to go wrong after he had finished the temple, 
And in chapters, uh, chapter 11, you read about uh, what's the root of what went wrong, what, uh, the root of uh, the things that went wrong, and that was that Solomon had married uh, uh, a whole lot of pagan women, 300 of them in all. I don't know how he coped with it, but, uh, uh, but there we are. Anyway, uh, he had lots of them, and he allowed them to build their little pagan temples and carry on with their pagan religion, which was a bit strange considering who his father was and how Solomon himself was the, was the one who had built the temple of the Lord. But after Solomon had built the temple, in, uh, you read in, in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1, when Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all that he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time and warned him that he needs to continue walking with God. But you can see what went wrong, you see. Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and he had achieved all that was in his heart to do. And I can imagine him after that saying, well, I had this vision for ministry, and it's finished. There's the temple, there's the palace, there's the kingdom, they're all as numerous as the sand on the seashore, they're eating, they're drinking, they're happy. What else do I do now? <laughs> How am I going to spend the rest of my life? And he gets up Monday morning, has a game of golf, because there's nothing else to do. On Tuesday morning, he does a bit of gardening, because there's nothing else to do. Wednesday morning, he goes for a ride in the country, because there's nothing else to do. Thursday morning, he's a bit fed up. Uh, Friday, he's bored to tears. Saturday's the day off, uh, and so he gets a day off from being bored to tears. Uh, and, uh, and Sunday's the day for worship, and he's, by this time, he's sick to the teeth, uh, wondering what else to, do, else to do, no vision left, nothing. Imagine running out of vision. And so he goes to visit one of his wives. And because it happens to be Sunday and it's her day of religious observance, uh, she's off to a little pagan shrine in Solomon because he's bored and nothing else to do. He says, oh, I'll come with you. Hmm? Well, um, it's a kind of parody of what happened, but basically Solomon had run out of vision. And he lived for 20 years after that. And those 20 years, he frittered away everything by uh, following the ways of his wives. Going to visit some wife and saying, well, what will we do today, dear? Hmm? Oh, it's my little festival when I need to go to the temple of Asherah. Well, I suppose nothing else to do, I'll come with you. Hmm? And before long, Solomon was patronizing the pagan cults. Uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God anymore, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. Verse 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon. Well, you can understand why. Now, <clears throat> the Lord became angry with Solomon, and uh, verse 14, the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary, Hadad the Edomite, and there were other adversaries we read, read about. Verse 23, God raised up against Solomon another adversary, Rezan, uh, the son of Eliada. And also in verse 26, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. You see, things are beginning to go wrong. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was one of Solomon's officials, one of the government ministers, and he uh, began to complain about things in Solomon's time and rebelled against Solomon. Now, verse 29. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem and Ahijah the prophet from Shiloh met him on the way. When things begin to go wrong, sure enough, who'll come along? A prophet. You see, God will have his people blessed. It's God's purpose that his people should live under the covenant blessing of Abraham. And the king is now leading them away from that. And God doesn't want them to be led away from that. God wants them led back to the covenant with Abraham. He wants them to be led back to blessing. 
And so God will not allow the king to lead them wrong without correction. There comes political correction, disturbance, political disturbance, but also God puts his hand on another man, a fellow called Ahijah, a prophet, and he says to him, Ahijah, thus says the Lord, my king is going wrong, you're going to do something about it. <laughs> and uh, Ahijah, I can imagine him saying, what me? The king? You got the wrong man, <laughs> send somebody else. I don't know what he said. But uh, the way the Lord did it was he sent Ahijah out to meet this official Jeroboam because God had already put his hand on this man Jeroboam. Uh, the, he was, he was the, the one. When, when the kingdom, when uh, Solomon died, all these uh, imperial territories got lost. The kingdom split along a line roughly across the top of the Dead Sea there. Jerusalem still remained as part of uh, the southern part Judah here. Uh, but all the northern tribes seceded from uh, the Davidic kingdom and they were led by Jeroboam and, they, and the northern part can't be known as Israel. Israel is sometimes used of the whole lot and sometimes just the northern tribes. But Judah, that's where we get the word Jew from, the Judas, the Jews, the Judes. Hmm? Uh, the, uh, Judah had the Davidic king reigning over it, but the north was led out in, in rebellion by Jeroboam. But God was behind it. Because in verse 29, the Lord sent Ahijah the prophet of Shiloh, and he met him on the way wearing a new cloak. Ahijah had just gone to CNAs and bought himself a new cloak, a new coat. Hmm? And the two of them were alone in the country. And Ahijah took this brand new coat, uh, which was quite a good one, no doubt, and, uh, and in front of Jeroboam's eyes, he said, Jeroboam, look, see, I've got a new coat. And Jeroboam must have said, that's nice. He said, well, watch this. And he ripped it into 12 pieces. Dramatic, eh? Jeroboam said, what are you doing that for? <laughs> There's a month's wages behind that. He said, ripped it up into pieces. Hmm? And Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. And then he said to Jeroboam, look, here, 10 pieces to you. Take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and give you ten tribes. But for the sake of my servant David, because I promised him that there would always be a son of David in Jerusalem, uh, for the sake of my servant David uh, and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. The, the missing one is the Levites, because uh, the Levites had no territory. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the, the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moabites, and Molech, the uh, god of the Ammonites. They've not walked in my ways. Verse 34, But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hands. I have made him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose, and who observed my commands and statutes. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. I will give, you one, give one tribe to his son, so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all that your heart desires, and you will be king over Israel. And if you do whatever I command you, and walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes, by keeping my statutes and commands, as David, my servant, did, I will be with you, and I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Well, <coughs> there you are. The word of the Lord, the Davidic kingship, is going wrong. But I have promised that there will always be a son of David ruling in Jerusalem. And I can't go back on that promise. But I will discipline David. And I'll take from David everything I can without breaking that promise. I'll leave him Jerusalem and one tribe. I, I, I mean, you can't leave less than one tribe. <laughs> I'll leave him that so that the lamp of David is still burning. I mean, this is severe discipline but I'll take everything from him and I'm giving it to you. And I promise you that if you walk with me, you can have it for as long as David has it. Uh, but of course, Jeroboam's sons didn't walk with the Lord uh, either and uh, D Jeroboam's dynasty didn't last. Uh, <coughs> but uh, you see, it's the prophet. Why 
Because God wants his people back to himself. God can only bless those that are walking with him. But it's the age of the prophets. From Samuel on, the prophets have desired this day, the day of Jesus. Well, it's not there yet, and they've got to do what they can in the meantime. And the word of the Lord came to Ahijah, and Ahijah went out and gave the word of the Lord to Jeroboam. Uh, uh, the, um, you read about the revolt of uh, the north in chapter 12, when the two kingdoms separated, uh, and uh, Ahijah appears again. Chapter 12, verse 12. Three days uh, later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam, as the king had said, Rehoboam was the, they're funny names, they're a bit like each other. Rehoboam was the son of David, Jeroboam is the, is the man who led the northern tribes out. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. And the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given by the elders, that he followed the advice of the young men. My father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people for, his, uh, for this turn of events from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. And when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel, look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. And King Rehoboam sent Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor, but all, the Isra all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escaped to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That was the, the breakaway point. And when all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. And when Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered the whole house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 fighting men, to make war against the house of Israel. He just lost all the northern tribes, you see. And so he's going to lead the army out to, to, to get them back, to make war against the house of Israel and to rega regain the kingdom for Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But the word of God came to another prophet, Shemaiah, the man of God. We don't know much about these prophets. They just pop up every now and then with a, a, a little word that acts as a corrective in history. Came to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to the whole house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says, do not go up and fight against your brother Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. Now just imagine the political situation. Here Solomon's dead. His son Rehoboam has come to the throne. And Rehoboam says to, the, says to all the tribes of Israel, look, you think my dad was tough. I'm going to be even tougher on you. And the northern tribes said, that's enough. We've had enough. We go. And they seceded from Rehoboam and they invited Jeroboam to become their king. Rehoboam is furious. He goes back home and he gets his army together. He says, look, we're not letting them get off with this. We'll go out and fight and win them back. And a little prophet pops up called Shemaiah somebody nobody's ever heard about and somebody nobody ever bothers about. And he says, no, you won't. Because thus says the Lord, this is my doing. And the army, when they heard that, they all shrunk back and dropped their weapons and went home. Amazing. I mean, can you imagine it? An army ready to go. They just lost their kingdom. They're out to win it back. And the little guy pops up and says, no, you won't, because this is God's doing. How can he get off with that? I mean, why didn't somebody just take an arrow and shoot him, drop him dead, and get out to battle? I'll tell you why. Because it was the Lord's doing. Huh? You see, back in verse 15, chapter 12, verse 15, the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord. It was from the Lord. Why did God not send an angel uh, to stand beside Jesus in front of Pilate and smite Pilate dumb or something so that Jesus got off? Because this turn of events was from the Lord. Who writes history? God does. 
And the man of God, the prophet, is the one who stands in the council of God like Samuel. He hears, he knows God. It's this knowledge. You don't, it's not the message you know, it's the man that you know. It's the one you know. You know God. And you know what God's plans are. You know what God's doing. And because you know what God's doing, you can stand up in front of anybody and say, this is what the Lord says. And you know whether they shoot you dead or they don't. It'll happen anyway. Hmm? This turn of events is from the Lord. No, you won't. You won't go to battle because this is God's doing. And the fact of the matter is that they all knew it anyway. They could see fine that it was. And that's why they dropped their weapons and went home. They knew that if they went to battle, they'd be fighting against God. When God's on the move... Now, remember, this nation had recently been walking with God. It's not as if they were people who didn't know the Lord, because it's only been the last 20 years that Solomon had been going wrong. This was a people who had known revival, a people who'd known the beauty of the temple worship, who'd known their Lord. Hmm? And when the prophet stood up and said, no, you won't, this is God, they knew the voice of God. And then you find it was silly to go to battle. Amazing, isn't it? Had you ever heard of Shemaiah before? I mean, he's not somebody that goes down in the history books. But he made history. If he hadn't stood up and said that, they probably would have gone to battle. And, uh, well, I don't know what would have happened. It's amazing the power of the prophetic word as opposed to the sermon. The prophetic word can make and unmake kings. There was a prophet, Ahijah, half of you probably never heard of him either because you hadn't read these chapters that carefully. Ahijah, the Shilonite. You know where the Shilonite means? He came from a town called Shiloh. You you don't, I mean, these are, are, are little guys that you'd never heard of. And he comes and stands in front of somebody else called Jeroboam, who you've probably never heard of either. And he made history. His prophetic word was the undoing of Solomon's kingdom. Not just because he was a revolutionary, uh, not just because he was a Che Guevara or anything like that, but simply because he heard the word of God. He stood in the council of the Lord, he could see God's purpose for history, and he spoke it, and it happened. The word still has creative power. How did God create in the beginning? God said, let there be, and it was. Through Ahijah, the prophet came to Jeroboam and said, let it be (laughs) that you will be the next king of the northern tribes. He didn't use those words, but it's like a creative word. The word coming forth through the prophet is the clear word of God and it has creative power. And this turn of events was from the Lord. So Shemaiah could come up behind him and say, no you won't, because this is God's doing. And that too has creative power. Why do you think Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy? Because your thus says the Lord will have more creative power than a thousand sermons. Hmm? <clears throat> I urge you, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Father, We thank you that your word is indeed life and power. And Father, we thank you that there have been men like these down the ages that have had the courage to stand in your counsel, to hear and to receive your word and to speak it. Lord, today we rejoice in the outpouring of your spirit. We rejoice in the gifts that you've given us. We rejoice in the blessings that you've given us. But Father, I know that so often this kind of power is lacking. And I pray, Father, that in these days you will revive this gift amongst us, that we can begin to touch something of the dynamic and the dimension of what these men knew. Lord, I thank you that today you call us heirs of the prophets, and that's good. But, Father, I pray that we'll have the courage to enter into our inheritance and to live in it and to know the power of it again. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen.